There was a gigantic patch and the last chance to qualify for World 2021 is just around the corner. Hello everyone and welcome to FECast episode 81 where we're going to break down a gigantic balance patch and preview your last chance to qualify for Worlds 2021 coming up this weekend. I am Sunnyvale, your host of course, and alongside with me as always is Stormblust. How's it going? It's going well. I really liked this patch. It's a great patch. The last balance patch we had was a little bit, uh, this balance patch, a little bit great. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of things got changed, and um, I mean, more than anything, more than scrutinizing every single decision, which we, of course, will do, but more than that, it's just nice to have a big shakeup. I think that's just generally a good thing that they can do in Eternal because of the digital nature of it, just to make it so that things are a little different and there's a bit of a different puzzle to solve. But I think one of the big things that made this balance patch so good, in my opinion, is that the shakeup was related to buffs, not nerfs, and that's always a little bit more exciting. And then, yes, some some cards that, that needed to be touched up a little bit got touched a little bit, and the best buffs, of course, are those that happen to wildly unplayable cards, turning them into actually playable cards, but we'll get there, we'll get there. Yeah, so after we talk about the patch, we will catch you up on FETL, it's really heating up, and it's been a blast to see those games play out. Uh, we'll get you ready for the LCQ that is coming up this weekend, and finally, we'll tie up any odds and ends that we think are worth uh, spending the time on. So without further ado, let's get into this patch. Uh, the link to the patch notes will be in the description, and it's uh, we'll, we'll try to say what we can, but there are so many things. So the first thing that is immediately on the page is that there are a bunch of nerfs to a bunch of aggressive cards. Oni Patrol now has Onslaught plus one attack, now becomes a 3-1 with the Onslaught instead of just a 2-1, this is the one-drop Oni. League Explorer, everyone knows League Explorer. It's charging in there on turn two. It has a double fire influence now, and now it just makes the depth charge more powerful rather than creating extra depth charges. Uh, Milos no longer has Overwhelm, and Pock Pock now costs four. I think all of these changes are pretty good. I don't really have a problem with Skycrack Aggro being good, and I think it'll still be good, but maybe a little less overbearing than it used to be. Yeah, I mean, Milo's not having Overwhelm definitely means that when I am really bad at the game and don't play my Sabretooth Pride Leader on my turn, I'm like, I'm going to get him, and then they play Milo's in attack, I'm less punished now because now I can just jump block the Milo's. <laughs> yeah, well, it's still huge, I mean. Yes, but now I get a chump block it, though, which is good. <laughs> yeah. All these changes seem fine. I mean, Oni Patrols, it's the classic Direwolf change of, you know, this unit's doing too good. We'll make it have one health. You know, the classic nerf, right? <laughs> the change uh, to every fire card. Yeah, basically. So as fun as it was to have a bunch of depth charges, so that way you could use them in various, you know, relic interaction ways. And that was really fun. That's obviously not how the card was being used more often than the other form of it, which is to just, you know, destroy your opponent. So making it so that it's more interactable is really nice, because obviously if you have some form of relic interaction in your deck, or like a Sabretooth Pride Leader, you know, and your opponent attacks with League Explorer, and they have, you know, three depth charges in play, and you play your Pride Leader, you know, do you kill one depth charge, or do you gain three life? Well, the answer is you gain three life, so, because that's more than one depth charge would have produced. So now that you can just kill the one depth charge, it's just more interactable, and I think that's, that's a solid change right there. Yeah, I agree. Also, Pock Pock just being played for free on turn two uh, is... Yeah. I mean, I, I guess it's just making Yeti players pay power for their Pock Pock. So I, all good changes, right? Basically, Pock Pock was a zero-cost Yeti, and now it costs one, right? It costs yeah. zero before, and now it costs one. And things that cost zero are just dangerous in general. And the reason it costs zero, dear viewers, is that most Yetis have three attack, can get three attack pretty easily. So. The fact that this thing had three cost and three attack meant that it basically cost zero for most Yetis you'd care about. Yeah, and I think it's just a like seeing Pock Pock being brought up to date with the times because I think when it was released, there weren't very many Yetis that had three attack. They all had two attack, so that's part of it. Yeah, there was like there was like one Yeti, like it was like um, 
like fearless yeti was the only yeti that had three attack and would cost two at the time and now there's like four of them yeah all right and the next one is one that i am very familiar with silver blade intrusion now no longer gets you a free three three valkyrie uh, I've benefited more than probably 99% of people from this card being broken, and I think this is a good change. I don't think we have to say much about that. Kilo Bolt Adventurer now costs three on its activation, but now is a 1-4. This is a really interesting one. Kilo is obviously a really cool card that when it does show up and do well, it's it's got a lot of thought put into it. But one of the big problems with Kilo is that I was always dying to torch, right? What do you think this will do for Kilo? Do you think this is enough? Do you think it's too slow now? I think it's very slow for the combo purposes, but it might be better in a more fun strategy. Um, not to say that combos can't be unfun, because obviously some people love combo, but combo is definitely like a one-trick pony. Like, you know, you got to definitely be that sort of player compared to other decks, which more players can enjoy and have interaction with the opponent and stuff. You know, because now you can actually play Kilo out and the opponent has to invest a real card into it. It dodges Torch. It dodges Hailstorm. I mean, it doesn't dodge the file, but it never did. Uh, yeah. You know, it dodges basically all the one interaction stuff. And obviously, you're not going to attack with it ever into a Defiance because that'd be silly. So yeah. I think it's a pretty good change. I like being able to play my cards out without having to be like, oh, no, my crucial piece got taken out really easily. So I think that moving it from the crucial combo piece to, you know, just like key card in the strategy makes it so you can play it out, but you don't feel too terrible if it goes away. Yeah, it is still just an investment cost of two, but it, it like if you're marketing for it and this is your one copy of Kilo, it's going to be a problem. I'm interested to see if it goes anywhere, of course, and and not dying to, you know, the random crossfire <laughs> like Torch and Hailstorm are kind of like, you know, random cards that just happen to be around. It does still die to Suffocate and Call the Hit, though, so I wonder if that's going to be an issue. Who knows? Suffocate doesn't really see much play right now. I guess it technically also dies to Sinister Rumors after an activation on it. But basically, roughly speaking, I think that this seals the deal in a lot of Kilo combo decks, but can maybe open up other Kilo decks. You know what they say, combo always lives. So maybe Kilo combo still ends up retooling itself and comes back in the next generation. Yeah. Here's the big one. Even-handed Golem now is a 2-2, but its summon is now draw one card or give an even-handed Golem plus two plus two. I don't think playing even-handed Golem as a 4-4 without drawing any cards is going to matter that much because you're giving up a lot of tempo by playing an even deck and then drawing just one card. It's basically a Temple Scribe. Yeah, even is... You know, Ding Dong, the Witch is Dead, the Wicked Witch is Dead, you know, Even Hand Golem is kind of bad now. Not not bad per se, but it's a, it's significantly worse. I will uh, agree with Direwolf that in their reasoning when they say that getting provided a decision makes the card more interesting to play with, but it also makes the card a lot worse to only draw one card compared to two cards. Yeah. Oh yeah, you get a 4-4, four four, which is a significant body, but, you know, compare that to Old Even Hand Golem, would you rather have a plus three, plus three weapon? Or two cards in hand. And I think you'd rather have two cards in hand. Yeah. I mean, I've always been on the record thinking that even hand golem wasn't too bad. I actually, you know, like being able to attack the even decks when I know they're there. But I can definitely see why they want to nerf something like this because it's given a lot of people headaches. Okay, let's go on to side buffs. I would say that these are buffs, but they do come with some, you know, pulling in addition to their pushing. So Kickflip Monk is now a 2-2. Two -two and it has plus two health and flying on the enemy turns. So this is the card that prevents, it has inscribed, cards can't leave voids. It's supposed to be a defensive unit, and now that defense has a two four, that is quite a bit better. It can attack much better. It gets to like say, you know, there is some crazy control decks in Expedition. You play a kick flick month previously, and it's just a one four, and your opponent's like, okay, I'll just like keep attacking with it forever. And then that way they can set up for their board clear that they definitely have there's 60,000 board clears in Expedition right now. And so they just wait to play a board clear and then they get an easy two for one. Now with the two, two, that puts a lot more pressure on. So the opponent will have to, instead of maybe even waiting for a three or four for one, they might have to just play their board clear and get rid of the kick flick mump plus your three drop or whatever. So having that extra two with power is really important on both offense and defense. Yeah, the other change is Cloud Scraper is now a five cost unit. I don't think anything else has changed on it, is it? No, no. So Cloud Scraper used to be a six cost, six five with inscribe contract two, put an enemy unit with cost two or less on the bottom of its oh. deck, 
And now it's contract two, put it in a unit with flying on the bottom of the owner's deck. So it really changed dramatically. Okay. Yeah, so that did change, especially since, as we see in Expedition, there's going to be a lot of Huru decks. It's a sneaky big body. I mean, five for a six five, that's that's large. I don't know if it's good enough, but I think that it's sneaky big. But it has not scribe, right? It's got the, the word on it. The capital T, capital W, the word. <laughs> it's like Evelina and Hojan and stuff. You know, the, like Hojan obviously wouldn't see play in Huru Heroes. I mean, maybe it still would, but like the fact that it has inscribe really pushes it over the top. So never count out a decent yeah. inscribe card is what I'm learning. Yeah. All right, the next change, Twisted Farmer is now a 2-3. This is the ambush, make a bunch of Mandrakes with Amplify, um, it, but it is double shadow now. I think this is a pretty big change because like, as a 1-3, you weren't actually meaningfully blocking anything. As a 2-3, you might be, and it also can like somewhat meaningfully attack. So uh, I think this is a pretty big change for Twisted Farmer, and I think it's going to start seeing some play in, in more defensive decks. The thing that I think is key about Twisted Farmer going to having two attack is it means that you now get attack equivalent to how much power you put into it. And that really helps the card out in efficiency as it needs to be. It's still not the most, you know, efficient card of all time. You have to sink a lot of power into it, and you're getting a very equivalent amount of stuff for power. The benefit to Twisted Farmer is its flexibility, and so it needed to have an effect commiserate to its rate, and now it does. All right. Going on, we have Rambus Challenge. I think this is just a limited change. Now cost two gives unit plus two attack a slow spell probably not seeing in constructed play one of your favorite cards know thy enemy now costs three to kill units that cost two or less but the amplify is three and i think this is a good change you can still amplify it once at six but you don't like you know pay 10 and then get four units uh, sorry three units out of it it's harder to go gigantic with know thy enemy which i think is probably a good thing because the amplify two seemed a bit low for the effect that you could get off of it i will miss my know that i have it, but it, it is probably for the best i will say that that i think the reasoning of with nothing remains being a part of the mix it makes sense to change it because nothing remains is a four cost board clear so having two four cost board clears yes there is something about like oh you have to choose which one's best for your deck which is it's just, it's just valid but making this card just different allows it to dodge the overlap and makes it more interesting to choose between them I think it's significantly worse overall because, you know, at three and six, it's obviously the same or better. But I think the key there is the eight and nine cost breakpoints. Going from eight to nine is a big deal. Yeah, this card would randomly just win you the game. And that was a big part of it. Like, I would say that was its primary function, even rather than being removal. And this way, it's <laughs> probably more true to its original design, where its real purpose is removal. And if you have enough power, maybe you can win with it. I think it's funny that there are and less of a way to arbitrarily win long games. And I'm like, it's not really arbitrary. That was the whole point of the card. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's another big one. The throne room. Same cost, same effects at three and six. But now it says when one of your units hits the enemy player, your heroes get plus one, plus one. No more Aegis. But that's actually a really interesting change. Most of the heroes aren't inexpensive. But it does happen each time they hit. So if you go plunk into the throne room, your plunk's going to start getting bigger. I think this is a good change. It just makes the relic base decks a lot more interactable by not giving Aegis over and over again. But I think, like, you know, this card could be better down the line, possibly. Another cute thing about this card is that when you make the Draka and the Island, because they are both heroes, they both get plus one, plus one when they're created, which is interesting. And, you know, you got cards like Zito that are also heroes. I think this is a really good change. I think it's always fun when Direwolf puts new mechanics on old cards. I think the key to Throne Room that made it so less than ideal gameplay-wise is it wasn't necessarily even just face Aegis that it got for free. It was repeated free face Aegis. So I think that this is a good change to, you know, make the card in line with everything else going on. Yeah. All right, now let's talk about the buffs. We're just going to go over the buffs that catch our eye. There's a really long list of them, and uh, if you want to go to the link and see them for yourself, please go ahead. The first one is, Bullseye now says, kill an enemy relic, not just kill an enemy relic that costs two or less. And I think this is huge, because now Bullseye can just randomly kill a uh, Stormhalt plating. That's the eight-cost weapon now, right? Yep. And it really 
discourages you from playing those really expensive relics as a top end, which I think is actually kind of problematic. I think like maybe if it killed a relic that cost four or less, it'd be fine. But just killing any enemy relic, that's pretty ridiculous, I gotta say. Now, like it's basically primarily a, a, a relic removal card. Well, the thing that makes it so good is that it, while you, you, you're like, oh, I'd rather use it as relic removal than the damage now, which is true, because you'd rather use it to kill a plating than to kill a, you know, a Lee Explorer, right? Like, obviously, you'd rather get seven extra power on your opponent than one extra power. At the same time, though, the thing that makes it so good is that it's not primarily relic hate in some sense, right? It's still also just char on units or sites, even. Against an aggro deck can actually be played, right? If the opponent doesn't have any relics, it still has game. The only deck that this wouldn't have any game against is a spell deck that doesn't play sites or relics and somehow wins without sites or relics as a spell deck. Or I guess any deck that doesn't play units with power two or with health two or less and no relics, but even still, like those are very specific situations. So Bozai is just really good against a wide range of decks now. Yeah, and notably, it also deals with things like Night Dojo. So, yeah, this card, <laughs> I, I think this escalated quickly from being, you know, like kind of an interesting decision between Char and this to, wow, this card has a ridiculous amount of application now that can kill any relic. Decro Conqueror now costs four cost. This is the Winchest faction flyer. It's a three five charge. Enemy units get minus one, minus one. Kind of interesting. It went from six to four. Um... I think it's like borderline good now, but it only affects Throne, and I don't think Winchester was doing too well in Throne, plus they had a bunch of good four drops. Arcana Monitor also cost four. That's the Praxis card that buffs all your units, and that had seen constructed play at some point, but I think we're beyond that with the number <laughs> of sweepers we have now. And uh, Throne Warden now cost four, so it's a four four. Aegis give you four armor, now cost four. Arcana Monitor, I'm not sure about. I never really played with the card back in the day, and I certainly haven't played it in years. Decro, big fan of Decro. Decro going from six to four. Decro was part of the cycle with Gren, I believe. Decro was really bad at six. It was a six cost three five flying charge, and now it's a four cost three five flying charge. It also, each enemy unit gets minus one minus one until your next turn, so it affects them on their turn as well, which is important to note. And I think the card is probably good. It's probably going to be really good in Throne, actually. I think the card looks a lot better suddenly now that costs two less and is, goes from wildly unplayable to actually playable. Additionally, I think Throne Warden is solid. I like the card. I always was like, I'm going to try out Throne Warden in things. And it was like, why would I play Throne Warden when I can play Quinn? I get to, you know, draw a card. But now Throne Warden costs one less, and it still gives you four armor. So it just looks like a really solid way if you're playing some sort of armory deck. Or if you're just wanting to gain some life and put out, you know, an Aegis body on board, four costs is a pretty good way to gain four life as well as stabilizing the ground. Yeah, definitely shuts down aggro. Let's go on. Tinker Overseer has a previous nerf, unnerfed. Now it's a two-two flyer. Depending on the like expedition metagame, I don't think it's an expedition, right? But like, it's got to be worse than Styr's Eye. It seems like it's pretty power crept by Styr's Eye nowadays. Would have been very good with League Explorer before League Explorer was changed. <laughs> yeah i guess so yeah uh huru sentry now has contract two deal four damage to an enemy unit with flying instead of contract four that seems like a big deal i think that the flying assault is if not a good strategy at least a strategy to be wary of and this helps it although it's also in the factions that you would have the flying assault i don't know it's just another way of dealing with helena and i'm a fan of another way of dealing with helena it's a flying assault card, Sonny, for the flying assault deck. It's just, it's just, it's the classic. We printed the counter for the deck that's being countered, uh, like like Combray Law Mage being the anti Kira Kira card. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the the cool thing about Huru Sentry, as far as mechanically goes, is that because it has Overwhelm itself, if you pay the contract and kill an enemy unit with less than four health, you can deal damage to their face equal the difference because it has Overwhelm, which is which is a fun interaction. Oh yeah, that is pretty cool. I don't know how often you're going to be taking out a relic, but like, I don't know, maybe the opponent has, um, what's that stone scar weapon, the 4-1? The bow. The, it has contract, yeah, the bow. Okay, um, let's keep on going. Stolen Augmentation gets a quality of life buff. That's nice. Argentport Sewers now <laughs> says your rats and rogues have plus one strength instead of uh, if you have three or more rats, sacrifice this, which I think is ridiculous because 
I don't know anyone who was able to use it uh, constructively in its original iteration. Yeah, its original iteration. It was it was so bad. Its original iteration, like it was like it was criminally unplayable, and now it's just probably unplayable. You're paying four for a relic that doesn't do anything that turn, and then your opponent can obviously kill it. And then on your next turn, you make two one ones, but then they can't or two ones rather, but they can't do anything because they can't block. So then you have to wait for your next turn after that, where finally you get to attack with two two ones. <laughs> two turns after you played a four cost relic where these two ones could not block, and your opponent can kill your relic at any point to reduce the threat, either the the pumping threat or the creation of the rats. That being said, though, it is significantly better than before. And probably would be fun to play a rat tribal deck, although Batteries doesn't like the card, and so, you know, that tells you something about the rat potential. Yeah, it's not as good as one of the other cards we're going to see. Um, Call the Hit is now a fast spell, which I I mean, that's a buff, obviously, and spell going from normal to fast is good, but I don't feel like it changes much. You have to make your decision on whether you want to play it or not uh, on your turn, because if you inscribe it, you can't do that at fast speed. I like this change because I like that it makes more interesting deck building decisions between this and other cheap shadow cards like Suffocate and Sinister Rumors. Previously, it really felt like you're just like, oh, I'm just going to play Sinister Rumors all the time because Sinister Rumors is just like Call the Hit, but, you know, has different flexibility than Call the Hit. But now Call the Hit has different power put into it in different ways than these other cheap shadow cards. And so I think it's a pretty good change. Moldermuck now has its cost reverted back to normal and being three cost. I think that's just because it was really good in that one expedition format and it doesn't really see play in Throne. Severin now has a cost of Shadow, Shadow, Shadow. This is the one cost Severin to return into play. I think this is pretty interesting. I had been trying to make Severin work. It seems like a pretty cool way of getting recursion, but it might just not be good enough that I'm willing to believe that. So previously, this is another one of those, like, unplayable to playable. Well, this was playable before because there's only so bad a one cost two one can be, right, Sonny? But previously, getting five shadow was, you know, just impossible. And by impossible, I mean, if you're playing a low to the ground deck, it's really, you might not even get to five power, let alone five shadow, if you're playing other things that aren't shadow. And also, on turn five, is that really when you want a free 3-1 on turn 5? Oh boy. But now you can get a 3-1 on turn 3 and then keep recurring it after that. And that makes the card a lot better. And probably is not overpowered and probably is just good. And so I think that's a very good change. Here's probably the biggest buff, perhaps. The Rat King now costs 3, which is, I think, pretty ridiculous. Now, for 3 power, you get a 5 attack worth of units spread over 3 bodies instead of a costing 4. We saw this shine in the Epi Tail playoffs. This is huge, right? <laughs> oh yeah, like, I thought Rat King was borderline playable before at 4, just like a solid body with way to interact. And now it costs 3. And that's significantly less, especially when it didn't change anything else on the card. It still has, it's still a 3-2. It still can sack things for one to take out the opponent's stuff, to shrink it, excuse me. And it doesn't, it still doesn't even exhaust. So it's just the same card as before. It just costs one cheaper, which is very significant in like every way. And, you know, you compare it to assembly line, assembly lines, you know, it's assembly line produces three power worth of attack and block and Rat King produces three power worth of block and five power worth of attack and also has sacrifice energy. <laughs> you care about sacrificing things. This is a card that gives you things to sacrifice and also a way to sacrifice things. It is just really good and efficient at three costs. So yeah, that, that card's insane. Yeah, no kidding. I, I think we're going to see a lot of this card next week in the expedition uh, last chance qualifier. Field Medic is now a 3-3. Three, three. I think that makes it better like against uh, control decks. I think it's the same against aggro decks, but I think that increases its playability. Don Walker now only requires double time. Like, these are changes that might matter, but I, I, I like Field Medic now. I like all the reversions of nerfs, right? Don Walker went back to its original form. Mulder Muck went back to its original form. Tinker Overseer went back to its original form. So I like that it looks like Direwolf is willing to revert nerfs when they make sense, instead of, you know, being like, we can't revert a nerf because it was nerfed, especially if it was like the Muck nerf and Tinker Overseer nerf, which were 
nerf for expedition reasons, not necessarily than throne reasons. So I like that they're willing to revert the nerfs back when the cards are no longer an expedition. Yeah, I mean, Don Walker used to not require any sort of influence, <laughs> which I thought which was pretty ridiculous, but this is better. Okay, Alessi is now a 2-2. I've tried out Alessi, and I didn't like it, even as a 2-2. So I think that, you know, this has a lot of people scared that Alessi stand together is going to be back, but I just don't think that's the case. <laughs> I mean, it's it's obviously better as a 2-2. I was never the biggest fan of Alessi, so I'm like, eh. Um, yeah. I like that they gave Goliath Axe a plus one health as if, like, that matters in the slightest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like an interesting card, but I still don't think it's good. Notably, Curiox Hunt now costs three, which I know that, uh, you know, some people, I've seen it a couple times in Expedition right now, because three is oh, really? a lot different than four, just like with Rat Cage. Rat King, excuse me. I'm not sure if it's playable in Expedition, but it is powerful, right? You, you're paying basically two extra on top of Predator's Instinct or one extra on top of Xena Initiation. But you get to draw that card, and that is more relevant than you might think. I don't know. I think it's still too clunky, because a lot of the time you'd want to play the Predator's Instinct on the same turn to give your yeah, unit initiative on a turn where you wouldn't otherwise have initiative. Okay, so Torgov's Wares, this is kind of an interesting one. Now it's a two-cost card, so it's kind of like strategize with upside now, but you do need the influence. People are talking about putting this in a lesion. There was some talk about maybe the influence matters more. But certainly this is a card to look out for, I think. The key here compared to strategize is you gain two health, which is big. You have any way to take advantage of discarding cards as well. I mean, that's even bigger, right? Like you can compare it to strategize and it just blows out of the water if you can reach the influence on turn two. But gaining two life on top of your strategize is really important just because, you know, what's the biggest downside of cards like strategize or, you know, even exploit for that matter? It's a two-cost card that doesn't impact the board. So if your opponent is just clunking you in the face, you can just die because you don't have the life to support it. Yeah, the two life gives you exactly what you need for what you're doing when you're doing this type of effect, which is gaining life. Uh, Della Free Profit now has lifesteal. That definitely makes it way better because it's unblockable, so you're always attacking, so you're always gaining three life. But I still think it's a bit underrate. Its largest downside in Expedition is that there's so many board clears in Expedition. Yeah, they're not targeting it. Then you know you just get kind of not necessarily blown out, but like if they get that two for one. You're 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 not happy about it. But I like that it gets life steal. I think that that's a very good change because I li I like making the card better because I think the card is super interesting. Mantor Lighthoof can now target relics, or no, they it can make enemy players sacrifice a relic. Do you think this means anything? I mean, Mantor Lighthoof. I had tried it out previously just for the unblockable. It's like a really weird change because the things that it's doing are not really connected in a way that makes a lot of sense. As far as everything on this list is concerned, it is by far the clunkiest on this list. Like all the other changes are like, yeah, we made the card play better. We made the card read better. Like with, uh, what's the card called? Uh, I have to scroll. Arden Port Sewers? Uh, that, that, well, Arden Port Sewers and Silverblade Intrusion, right? Those two are the probably the big ones where it's like, we made the card have better play and we reduced its clunkiness and whatever but this one it just got way clunk it just got massive clunk did it need the clunk probably but at the same time though definitely there's clunk there and i don't even know if it's expedition legal it's just throne legal right is it expedition legal i believe so i <laughs> i believe so but i think there's too much uh competition anyway so that one's just a weird change i think as far as that goes it basically replaces burglarize in the market potentially because it's better to have a unit that costs four than a spell that costs four. But like, if they have two relics, you're out of luck. Yeah, but, but what if they don't have two relics? <laughs> okay, I guess so. What if they don't, Sonny? <laughs> um, Arcanum Seeker has Overwhelm, but I look, there aren't enough Life Force cards in Expedition to really care about that that much, I think. Sea of Teeth now costs six. That makes you very happy. Woo! The amount of, you know, uh, treasure troves that have been slipping under the table for Direwolf has finally paid off. They've decided to print my, <laughs> they, print, they printed me in a set, and now they've buffed one of my favorite cards. So that's all I'm saying is that these troves are Jeez. paying off. So yeah, Sea of Teeth is significantly better at six than at seven. And it's crazy how much one cost can change a card, because at seven, it was expensive, and you really had to play for it. And now at six, it's like, oh, you can just play it in your market instead of Passage of Aeons, or like, it compares to, say, Predatory Carnosaur, which was a 6-6 six, six killer for six. 
and this is a 5-5 five, five killer for 6, right? They're different where, you know, if there's a 5-5, a five, five, Predator Carnosaur lives, Sea of Teeth would not. But Sea of Teeth can also, you know, clean up a board of X1s where Predator Carnosaur cannot, right? So and it's, not, it's not necessarily that one's better or worse than the other. Sea of Teeth also works better with um, Pump, although you can't really have Pump because it kills all attachments. So if you have a Xenon Obelisk, it will die. But yeah, it's, it's significantly better at 6 than at 7. We have Ice Bolt now cannot be negated or stopped by Aegis. I think Ice Bolt's downside is just big enough that that's not going to make it playable. Although it's an interesting change for Garden of Omens. Although, actually, wait, isn't that text on Garden of Omens anyway nowadays? Okay, maybe yeah. not. <laughs> oh, it is. That is that is just text on Garden of Omens. Oh, wow. They just they gave that. I, I, I didn't even think of the implications there that, that Ice Bolt and Garden of Omens couldn't be negated or stopped by Aegis. And now Ice Bolt and Garden of Omens can definitely not be getting a stop page. <laughs> it doubly yeah. can. So wait, so basically what right. it does is that you play, no, the here's, here's how that works on it. So your opponent has their counter spell and the bullseye in hand, and you play the Garden of Omens. And then previously, <laughs> they'd bullseye the Garden of Omens, and then they'd counter the Ice Bolt, but now they can't do that. That is true, technically. <laughs> All right, Derry Cathane is now a one-cost card, which is really interesting because now it's a zero four that uh, you can pay three to make it a four four Overwhelm. That seems pretty good, although you have to be okay with it just doing nothing for a couple of turns while it's in there. Last time I played with Derry Cathane, it felt like it didn't do enough. It didn't like do anything proactively enough. And against control players that had a lot of spells that you would make them more expensive, it just wasn't worth it paying two to get a spell, make one more. But I think this is a really interesting change. I've played a lot of Derry Cathane because I've, I've always wanted Derry Cathane to be good. and. Spoiler, it never was. It was, like, always terrible. It never felt great to play. It always felt clunky and slow. But now it costs one less. So, like Throne Warden of Yore, this is now, a, you know, a quote-unquote 4-4 four, four Overwhelm for 4, rather than a 4-4 four, four Overwhelm for 5. You can slot it in better if you go Dairy into Wump, or whatever you want to do. Or just, you know, Depleted Power, Dairy, Depleted Power, right? So, I'm interested to try out Dairy yeah. again. If prior experience has told me anything, though, Derry will end up being sad and pitiful once again. But it might not be this time because it finally is a one drop. So I'm hopeful, but I'm, I'm, I'm tempering my expectations because I've, I've been burned in the past by Derry Cathay previously. <laughs> um, and a couple changes. Illuminator now costs three and Fear is now a 7-7. Seven, seven. I don't think those really mean too much. Like the size of Fear was not a big deal. Illuminator is interesting I guess, I guess it's a 3-3 overwhelm always then it becomes a 5-5 five, five overwhelm you gain two life but like at the same time you know you compare it say champion of chaos which also has you know a condition to become a 5-5 five, five deadly overwhelm and this is just a lot worse because it's not a 5-5 five, five when you need it to be because unless you play specifically like power cell turn two or warning shot turn three it's not going to be a 5-5 five, five. i think it's good to change it because it was really bad before like even in draft yeah. it wasn't very good in draft i think for draft purposes i really like this because yeah it means that you can actually like play like a searing fist into illuminator or whatever or just play an illuminator out because it's a three through overwhelm which is perfectly fine in draft so i think that's fine and as far yeah. as fear goes i like that it looks more aesthetically pleasing being a six six for seven <laughs> it didn't look good and now it just like looks better to look at so that's true maybe that'll convince more people to experiment with it all right, so the FETL wrapped up its regular season with the end of the Opens and now is in playoffs. In round one, Team Invoke Lethal defeated the Snow Fort, and in round two, the semifinals, uh, they defeated Team Rankstar. So Team Invoke Lethal will be going to the finals on January 9th to face off against TBC, Stormblast and his minions, I suppose. And uh, <laughs> yeah. My minions? <laughs> yeah, your minions. Okay, that—that's what they call themselves, right? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I'm sure GT would agree with you. It wouldn't have anything to say about that. <laughs> uh -huh. So, um, we already saw the impact of some of these patch changes in the expedition decks that were played in this tournament. So, let's talk about some of the expedition decks that the teams brought before the patch. There was Argentport. Control and there was Hero Heroes and Stone Scar Control. Of them, the um, Argentport Control deck looked pretty good with Nothing Remains as a sweeper at four. And of course, the Hero Heroes deck looks pretty solid. It can play what's that called? The one cost negate a slow spell? Obsessive Flicker. Yes. 
I usually just call it flicker, um, in order to stop a sweeper from sweeping up their rather expensive, efficient units. In addition to that, we saw a new deck come out of TIL this last weekend. They called it Ninjas. Uh, Really what it is, is it's Felm Heroes, so it uses Zolta Ambassador, Plunk, and the new Rat King in order to go with Eodria and pick off units that try to attack because they get one health because of Eodria, and then the Flicker or the Rat King can make short work of them. So those are just some of the decks that we saw in FTETL. As you'd expect from an Apple Chips uh, oriented deck, it has Waxing Moon in it, and then it has the Audrey <laughs> for five through eight copies of Waxing Moon. <laughs> yeah. It's been really cool to see the playoffs of the FETL and how the teams are approaching it. Like, for example, in the last round, TRS brought the same expedition deck for basically all three of their matches. Basically the same expedition deck. There were some changes. But whether the teams are playing to their player strengths or just going with what they think is objectively the strongest strategy they can it was really interesting to watch it was really interesting to cast and there was a lot of really great plays being made on both sides it looks like trs did not diversify their decks and that ended and no, neither team really diversified their decks in some sense but uh today til came in with a little bit of edge with a little bit more strategizing and it seemed to have paid off for them yeah upsetting the higher seed twice to go on to the finals. It's been a lot of fun, I think, and not just because I'm the one that's running it. I think it really has been a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to more FETL, and there will be a season two. I don't know if I've announced that on FECast before, but I am planning to start up a season two after Worlds in February of 2022, and it's going to feature this head-to-head format that the playoffs are in much more heavily. In fact, I mean, it's no longer going to be tied to the open series, but rather will just be head-to-head matches between teams. And I'm looking forward to it. I think it should be a lot of fun. Okay, so the uh, last chance qualifier is happening this weekend. This is December 17th through 19th. We're recording this on Monday. This cast will probably go out on Tuesday. So let's go over some things that we think might be good ideas for deck building because we did just have a patch and things are still being fleshed out. So we're going to start by talking about cards that we think are good just like generically powerful cards. And in Expedition, what tends to happen is that these powerful cards kind of overshadow a lot of the other filler cards that you need to have because the card pool isn't so big. So uh, atop our list is Plunk. I think most people have figured out that Plunk is a very good card. Attacking, blocking, dodging, removal, drawing cards seems to do it all. Yeah, there's not really much more to be said. Plunk is cheap and very effective. Yeah, the way to deal with Plunk, I found, is to play one cost two ones. Right, because then you can block it and then trade and go up power that way. But that's basically it. You just you have to block it. Otherwise, you need like what a two five. I guess there is a three cost two five that can deal with it. I mean, there's Vars Authority. It's kind of their only removal. I mean, I guess I guess you could play Stone Scar and play Oprex's Choice. That gets rid of Plunk, but only if they don't play like a Zito on turn like two or three or whatever. Yeah. Speaking of which, I did not realize that Vorprex's Choice was fast now. That is very good. I, I think that we did talk about that at one point, but it just hadn't d- occurred to me until now. Next card on our list, which is obviously very good, is the Rat King. We've gone over this. I don't think we need to talk more about it. The next card is also, you know, something that a lot of people have been uh, experiencing, and that is Helena, the 3-4 Endurance Flyer that can jump a unit for some extra damage. How do you deal with Helena? I think that's a good question. Is Searing Fist just like the best way to deal with it? Is Cloud Scraper now a good way to deal with it? How can we fight back against Helena? There are some removal options. You only have one unit. Again, Vopex's choice kills anything, Sonny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you're playing Flyers, you can play the 4-3 Owl that now has Contract 2, right? So you're playing with Helena and against Helena at the same time. I think one of the big answers is going to be just like go bigger than Helena. Because, you know, after the jumping, which can be scary. I mean, the jumping does require them to lose a turn, though, right? Like, say if they jump Plunk on turn 3 and they hit you for six, you know, they're losing like a turn and a half with that uh, with that play right there. So the best way to deal with it is to, in a sense, potentially not deal with it and just like do something bigger, force them to engage with you. But if you wanted to remove it directly, Searing Fist is a decent option. Oh, or, you know, Rat King plus Call the Hit. Yeah, we saw that in the FETL Dude. playoffs. Like Board Clears and Defiance yeah. are probably the biggest ways to deal with it. You know, Saloon Massacre, Nothing Remains, Harsh Rule, Elemental Fury and defiance all kill it so 
So I think that people jump their units too readily. Like, I think on turn three, you should basically never jump something unless it's permafrosted. Yeah, I, I just think that people are using the contract too liberally there. Why are you playing permafrost in a hell in the metagame is my question. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't think that despite permafrost being in the format that I don't think it's going to really see much play, especially since like some of the cards that you would want to permafrost that are early plays like it doesn't do anything against Rat King. I, I guess it does something, but it doesn't stop it from activating. A lot of units are still getting their value, even if you permafrost it. OK, so next on our list is Oni Insider and Battlefront Dasher. I think these are two excellent charging fire units for aggressive decks. It also makes it so that it's like difficult to play relic weapons because charge is very good against relic weapons. Do you have anything to say about these two aside from they are the cards that you should start with in a fire deck? I think Odin Insider, I still think it's a really cool card. I like the design of it. It's not as efficient as Dasher in a lot of ways because, you know, you pay four for a 4-1 charging Warcry, right? That's not the most efficient, but you can pay two plus one and then charge something else in the future later. And of course, Battlefront Dasher is, you know, a solid 3-2 when it needs to be for one, but also can kick something else into high gear in the late game as, you know, one cost rider. So, yeah, just solid, solid starts to any fire-based aggro deck. Nothing remains, Saloon Massacre and Harsh Rule. This seems like the uh, the best sweepers, I guess. There's also Vara's Authority, but I think this format doesn't have enough um, Aegis to really make that very important. I mean, Nothing Remains, I think, is the best one, It's but it requires being Argentport, and that might be a good enough reason to play Argentport. Um, <laughs> but if you are just in Shadow, you can have Saloon Massacre, and if you're just in Justice, you can have Harsh Rule. I think the format's just balanced around Nothing Remains, so you should play that. <laughs> yeah, the funny thing about Nothing Remains is that it gives everything void bound, which can be relevant to your own units in Origin Port if you're playing Sinister Rumors and you've like a Rat King and you're like, I gotta play Nothing Remains, but I guess I'll never get back this Rat King again. It's kind of funny, but yeah, it costs four. Do you know how efficient four is? Four is like zero, basically. <laughs> <laughs> four is the zero of a sweeper? Yeah, basically. It also stops your opponent's sinister rumors, and you can't really see the effects of that as easily. But yeah, I think that's also a big deal in this format. It also stops revenge if your opponent yeah. has Zito or, you know, big old Zoe in play. You're like, oh, I'm going to nothing remains their Zoe. And then they're very sad because you just got the much better deal on that. <laughs> so in addition to these good sweepers, there's also good cheap removal in Defiance and Torch. I think that makes cards like the Rat King just even better because you can get value off of it even if they use a cheap removal and if they, they use an expensive sweeper then you know that was going to deal with whatever you played anyway there's diminish permafrost bullseye sinister rumors searing fist Voprex's choice of things that cost two right there's there's a whole lot of cheap removal to choose between this format this format is incredibly interactive and has a lot of powerful things going on all right, so speaking of powerful things, the Hero Synergy card, Gold-Plated Revolver kills people real fast. If you do not have an answer for Helena Gold-Plated Revolver, you're probably dead. Uh, Zoltan Ambassador can draw a ton of cards, and Greater Plans is like a nice power. The power bases in Expedition aren't really that great, and Greater Plans helps a fair amount. Yeah, I mean, Greater Plans and like Zoltan Ambassador and or Gold-Plated Revolver, right? three cards that really work with heroes so well. In Throne, greater plans, and it probably would still make the cut in, like, crew heroes, but it definitely is a lot better in Expedition than it would be in Throne, because in Expedition, you only get two duels, so warping your deck for greater plans to give you that third duel is pretty worth it, especially when it gives you access to one of the other two aforementioned cards. Uh, Gold Player Revolver just, you know, really makes your opponent say, do you have an answer to this, otherwise you're dead in three turns. And Zoltan Ambassador says, do you have an answer to this, otherwise you're dead in seven turns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah can you answer this or kill me yeah the Zoltan blaster even if they draw three cards on it you're still dead in seven turns even if they kill it three turns later whereas gold player revolver if they kill it three turns later you could still lose the game be based on tempo or whatever uh but it is the most efficient card but yes i mean Zoltan ambassador has really impressed me that card i, I was uh underrated heavily and it's been phenomenal yeah i think both of these cards i underrated unfortunately Another card I underrated, Sindane's Bracers. If you are playing a time-based deck, you almost certainly want this. It'll get you a ton of power. And what can you use that power for? Uh, Javen uh, can draw a ton of cards. So that's another power aspect, although it is a lot slower and less efficient than some of the other things we're talking about. 
it's it's just a great synergy because Yavin is already a hero, so it's not like you're really giving up much to put Sindane's Bracers in there. Male presented a really bad argument for Sindane's Bracers, and then presented a really good argument for Sindane's Bracers. And the bad argument was, it's a three-cost relic that gives you plus five power. And I'm like, that's not how anything works at all. You didn't convince me in the slightest, because on turn three, it's not plus five power. And then the much better argument was a comparison to High Prophet of Soul. Uh, for those of you who don't remember, High Prophet of Soul is the two at a time for an O3 cultist, plus one maximum power. And when another cultist goes to your void, plus one maximum power. So if you if you don't remember those days, High Prophet could really crank up the power. I believe there was even like an ECQ match where both players had like 18 and 20 power. And they just kept having this High Prophet just like exist. And Synthes Bracers kind of is a similar thing where it's a thing that sits on the board, but in comparison to High Prophet, it's a relic and not a unit, which means it's differently intractable, usually a little bit less, although you do a bullseye now. But over time, it'll just slowly give you a bunch of power, and then eventually, if you have just some way to use the power sink, in this case being Yavin as the big one, but there's other ways too, like, you know, cheating out a great Kiln Titan, for instance, over time, and it will just get you there in the end. Yeah, for sure. And notably, it doesn't die to Scare in this format, right? I guess it does <laughs> die to Oni Insider, maybe, but or or I guess Bullseye, um, but it doesn't just die as easily and randomly as uh, High Prophet of Soul did. So I we'll talk about Icy Hold, which Kind of is a stand-in for a lot of the Invoke cards, although specifically I want to talk about Icy Hold. The Invoke cards are, I think, better than people might be giving the credit, especially Icy Hold. I'm in, like, bronze right now, like silver, but other players have been playing it in higher rankings. And Icy Hold is just, it's a little expensive, but, like, silencing plus stunning is a real thing, especially when it's attached to fast speed and also gives you an Invoke. And the one thing this format's lacking, if you've, if you've been looking at all the stuff here, the card advantage there, is not necessarily at its peak, right? In Throne, there's a lot of basic card advantage. In Expedition, there's a lot less. You know, a lot of the cards we named are some of the only ones that give you it. Zoltan Ambassador gives you it. Rat King gives you it. Plunk gives you it. That's why these cards are so good. It's because it's some of the only ways to get card advantage. And Icy Hold is just a way in your interaction suite, not having to put out your um, proactive suite to get card advantage. So that's why it's worth considering. Uh, and then my other point is that blueprints and sneak power are poop. Don't be playing them. Play your inscribed cards instead. Inscribe, yes. Seek power and blueprints, no. <laughs> yes, true in draft, and turns out true in constructed as well. I think that there is a case for Argentport blueprints because, like, you can use revenge to get destiny units, and then the pay seven basically gets two units back and draws additional cards from that. So I think that has a an argument, but the rest of them, yeah. That's true. If you're playing blueprints, you really should consider in the sense of like, would I play this effect? Not for that cost, but would I play this effect in the deck as just as like as just like a card? Uh, you know, for example, like, would you play you know the stolen scar for two relic weapon with warcry? I mean, maybe you would, but like for seven cost, not even close. Even the horror one, like, would you pay the put a copy of a card into your hand for seven cost? Probably not. But like, would you draw two cards for two? In Argentport, you might. I mean, that's why, you know, like uh, the hero one, right? Inseparable. That could be a consideration in Argentport. But the difference is, is that here, you get it plus your power out of your deck, right? So yeah. that's why I think Argentport is probably the best one of the lot. Yeah. Okay, so now that we've talked about all these cards, how can we fit them into strategies? What are strategies that might be good? Let's start with the Felm Night Dojo deck that we saw out of TIL in the last deck. The more I thought about it, the more that deck seemed great because Eodria just makes everything a pain. And there, all these removal cards we caught, talked about, aside from the sweepers, there aren't great ways of dealing with Eodria. I mean, the ways of dealing with Eodria are very similar to the ways of dealing with Helena in some sense because they're both three fours. Yeah, I guess so. Eodria can't be, uh, you know, permafrost either or diminished. If you diminish Helena, then Helena's, you know, diminished. But if you diminish Eodria, Eodria is still doing its Eodria thing, so. Yeah, so that synergies with uh, the flicker. Isn't it obstructive, not obsessive? Whatever. It's the, if you use that with flicker or rat king or ping effects, that can be very good. Or just like one one flyers, I guess. And then the night dojo seems like a pretty good way of just getting way ahead if your opponent isn't fast on the board because you just generate a ton of card advantage from that if you can protect it. So this deck seems really good to me. That seems like maybe it's the deck to beat as of right now. And and granted, it is very early. 
it's uh, both early and also we're definitely biased because we saw it just absolutely annihilate Huru Heroes the other day. So maybe it has lesser matchups versus other decks, and it probably does because Huru Heroes has no way to interact with either Eodria or Waxing Moon or really Night Jojo in ways that it wants to interact with Night Jojo. So like, you know, it, it kind of just was a really bad matchup overall, but at the same time, it did look really impressive. Yeah, and I think one way to deal with it is like flying attackers are pretty good at pressuring the dojo, but you also just need like some more removal to deal with ambassador or keep the board clear for when you do have to attack the dojo. It'll be interesting. It, it, it creates a lot of pressures on the format, and I think you have to be able to adapt to those. Next one on our list is, of course, Huru Heroes. Can definitely be a good deck, although <laughs> I think it needs to be reconstructed somewhat from what TRS brought just because of a deck that might be like the the Night Dojo deck that we saw because it just didn't have good ways of interacting. And and those things do exist like the what's the what's the card that deals two damage that that card might help out against uh, some of the things that that deck's doing dealing with Ambassador dealing with Rat King at least Trick to shot? some degree. Trick shot the snowball one. The one that makes a snowball but for one cost? Yeah. A trick throw. Trick throw. Yes. Trick throw. There we go. I, th- I was like, trick shot? Isn't that like a combat trick? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it just needs to adapt to the metagame, I think. There's the AP control deck that we saw the previous week. I think this is going to be the control deck of the format. I think this is going to be the way to go. I don't know if control is good right now. There are definitely situations where you don't want to be playing control in a format. But I think if it is, I think this is the way to build it. Some of the Huru cards are really good at controlling, but I think just getting nothing remains at four is huge. I think if control is not good, it'll be on the basis that Zoltan Ambassador and Plunk are good, and those are good ways of fighting control decks. Plunk being Aegis as well as drawing cards, and Zoltan Ambassador just drawing cards helps put these sort of mid rangey hero decks just go over the top of the control decks because if every hero you get draws you a card, you don't necessarily care as much about the nothing remains that happens. If Plunk draws you a yeah. card, you don't really care about it being removed because it's already getting to a two for one. So, definitely, any control deck is going to have to think about well, what if they play a Plunk because that has Aegis and is cheap and draws cards and is attacking for a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and is dealing a lot of damage. Uh, yeah, Plunk's a good card, by the way. Um, okay, next on our list is Praxis. I've seen this on ladder quite a bit, using Sindane's bracers to get a ton of power, and then using cards like. Is it Azrog, the name of the six cost yeah. unit? And also going up to Great Kiln Titan, just just going really big with Praxis ramp. I mean, this deck seems good. Do you know any strengths or weaknesses of it? Might be a bit slow. Yeah, I mean, probably the biggest weakness is that it's it's a bit slow and can be clunky at times, especially if you don't draw the bracers. If you don't draw the bracers, you have to play the the more fair game, and that obviously is not where it's gonna be ideal, though it probably is still fine. Being in fire. I think it's probably the deck that's the most likely to play the full suite of fire uh, removal spells. That is to say, Bullseye, Torch, and Searing Fist. It might play all twelve of them because it just might need to. It doesn't because time doesn't have many good interaction. And in. while you might not want to play all of those, you know you're not going to feel too bad either. Another possibility is Stone Scar, the bow, the the relic weapon that costs two, amplifies for two, and there are a few ways of getting it back. Vorprex's choice is fast and deals with everything, as Stormblast said. Um, and then you can go up to the Inscribe 6-drop Oni that gives weapons double damage and maybe kill them with your bow after getting it back and making it a 6-1 weapon this time with double damage and Overwhelm. Yeah. And it means that your torches have double damage. So, like, that's a really cool, neat little source of interaction there. I think you really want to be playing Zoe, probably, in Stone Scar, because otherwise, why aren't you just, like, playing Argent Port then or something? <laughs> Zoe is probably pretty cool. It's a big recursive threat that's hard to deal with and i think that that is something that you know this format seems to enjoy the, the games can't go long enough that you can get the zoe back and obviously if zoe hits it does a lot of damage and it's hard to block because it's a 5-5 flyer yeah well i guess i i want to have a strategy where i can kill them with relic weapons but it never seems to pan out because if they have two units you're just out of luck <laughs> yeah well th- that's why you play stormhold planning sunny because then you can kill both units yeah, uh, that has been a very good card, although uh, we haven't seen it too much lately. I think it would only be an AP control. It's just a matter of whether people have bullseyes or not to take out your eight cost weapon. <laughs> That's the card we didn't mention in cards that are good. I think I think uh, Stormhawk Plating is very good. 
That's true. It also gains you life for if you're just, you know, need to buy time. And finally, Rakano Agro can't have a list of strategies that might be good. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't include Rakano Agro. You've got charge units and you've got cheap units and you've got some reach with some burn and you've got Helena and pump spells. What's not to love? Yeah, I'll be honest. I was a little bit skeptical of Rakano Agro, but JNL did a really impressive job you know, showcasing the deck and, you know, shutting things down. You know, he was guaranteed to be on the play, which is a big deal for a deck like Rakano Agro. But at the same time, the deck looked fairly impressive and their cards like Inferno Phoenix seem really good. And, you know, I think the deck looked really solid, actually, surprisingly. Surprisingly yeah. solid in my expectation. Although Sunny, Sunny was probably like, oh yeah, of course Rakano Agro would be great. I love being an Agro deck. <laughs> <laughs> It's good to know why I sound like, um, because, you know, it's hard to hear what your own voice sounds like. So I'm glad you were able to provide that for me, Stormblast. Um, I think this deck is a lot like the set one Rakano deck, because, like, the card pool is limited. You've got Torch, you've got Finest Tower, those are really powerful cards. And then you've got a random big charger unit at the top end with the Phoenix instead of uh, Soulfire Drake. And it does a pretty good approximation of it. Nothing hits hard, six damage. And this is kind of how all the expedition feels. Expedition feels a lot like set one slash two of Old Eternal, but with just like better cards overall. The games feel not the same, but they feel in the same ballpark, but like the cards are better. Like Inferno Phoenix is really powerful, and like Varbuck, Helena obviously didn't exist back in the day, you know? So like the cards are just like individually better, but at the same time, a lot of the games feel in the same realm of things, especially because we don't have merchants. Oh, yeah, that's true, too. No markets. Definitely. I didn't even think about that, but that is very set one-y. And I, I guess the monuments are not too different from inscribed cards, right? Yeah, especially the cards that cost five. <laughs> <laughs> that's very funny. All right. So um, if the tournament was tomorrow, what deck would you register? What do you think? Well, the thing is, is that I can register many decks because this tournament has a weird format, remember? Oh, yeah. Maybe we should talk about that before we talk about what deck we're playing. <laughs> All right. So the LCQ is this upcoming weekend, December 17th through 19th. And, uh, well, it's got a different format. So basically the way it works is that you can have as many tries as the tournament as you want. The tournament, and, it, and it's each is a run of up to seven wins or two losses. And it costs only 4,000 gold or 300 gems instead of the regular, you know, 28,000, 1,600 or whatever it is. And if you get seven wins, you get to day two. If you get 7-0, you get directly to top 64. So there's kind of a preliminary single elimination round before the top 64. that will hopefully be relatively short, maybe. It depends on how the tournament stacks out. I also try something experimental here. And you get as many runs as you want. You don't get just like four runs, and you get to see if you get a seven win there. No, you can do as many times as you want. And if you get 7-0 in any of them, you progress directly to the finals which is interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting format. At first, I hated it because, you know, basically, if you have infinite time and money, you can guarantee that you qualify, and that kind of defeats the spirit of the competition. And that might be somewhat problematic, but it also means that, you know, good players don't have to spend as much gold, or lucky players, good or lucky players, don't have to spend as much gold. I did some math on this, and it actually isn't too different from the qualification system that we normally have of playing 28 best of ones as far as like how much gold you'll end up paying or you know what your chances are of qualifying. Obviously, there are differences and there's more variance per run, but it's not ridiculous, right? It's actually a pretty close approximation. Oh, wow. I haven't looked at the prizes for like a tournament in a quite a while, because um, they're all the same, but the prizes for this tournament are very different than normal. Normally, we only get packs. Here, we're actually getting chests. You actually get gold back from your prizes. Like a six-two finish in the in the day one is gets you back a diamond chest, which is almost enough to just do another entry. Isn't it half of it? Isn't it about two thousand? But yeah. like that is a pretty big refund. Yeah, uh, we'll see how this goes. I think that you know I have a negative gut reaction to this change, but I think we should reserve judgment until we play it and then see how we feel about it after a while. You could also get into a spot where you're like on your tenth run trying to qualify and just can't make it, and that probably feels really miserable especially if you've gotten close in a few spots so yeah we'll see you have to go 7-1 in order to qualify for the preliminaries in day two and then from the preliminaries you have to win even more if you win you get a giant owl 
Wait, is that a statue now, or is that an actual owl? The wisdom of the elders alternate. I art? thought it was an actual owl. Probably is that they, they, the turtle's known for its huge owls. So yeah, I man, I, like I just what I would like is a, a smaller cut to the top, like more games on day one, and then a smaller cut to the top. Um, because I feel like I generally do pretty well on day one, and day two I've had <laughs> some issues because there's just a larger sample size of games on day one. But like. I don't know if that's what they want. I like that Daryl is trying a new thing and, you know, maybe it won't work Maybe they'll adjust it for the future. I am kind of in the boat of, like, I don't like that you get unlimited runs, although it does mean that I can just, like, play with any deck. I'm just like, I just wanted to try out this random deck and see what happens, which is definitely where I'll be, <laughs> basically. But time it would be nice if they, would, like, if, if they were to cap it at some, like, absurdly high number, like, you get six or seven runs, I think that would be a lot better to most people than, like, being like, you can do 30,000 runs. <laughs> so on the other hand, like there aren't crash prizes for this, right? So everything's just way different. That's why there's, that's why they're giving out chess because there's no cash prizes. That's right. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Weird. Anyway, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Good luck, everyone who's playing. Okay. So now that with that in mind, what are decks that you're interested in for this weekend? I'll start. I am interested in this dojo deck, but I also want to see if I can make the um, relic weapons deck in Stone Scar. The Rat King is extremely powerful, and I feel like if you're playing any sort of shadow deck, you should probably play it. Maybe not control. I don't know. But, boy, that card is ridiculous right now. Why would you play any control? It blocks, and it also removes things. It's literally removal. Kind of. It's really expensive, slow removal. Yeah, but it's still a 3-2. It can block. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> it's really good, Sonny. <laughs> So those are decks that I'm interested in. I'm going to look at the Night Dojo deck and see how I feel about it. What about you, Stormblast? I'm interested in Night Dojo, Argentport Control, Stone Scar, Rakano Aggro, Combre, Peru Unitless, Combre, I already said Combre, um, <laughs> or Faction Heroes. What else am I interested in? I don't know. I'm interested in just like lots of things. As you can see, I, I just like the idea of, you know, Dex. <laughs> I like the idea of Dex, Sonny. Dex in general. Trying out new things. Yeah, I suppose so. I don't know what the best deck is. So, like, it feels... Remember that one expedition where, like, every deck felt like it was good? It kind of feels similar to that, except in the sense of, like, we don't know that every deck is good. It's like, we don't know what's good, per se. Whereas the, that other expedition, the one with uh, Mandrakes and Tessa, where it's like, every deck felt good. That, that Remember that one? That was such a weird metagame, where every deck felt great for some reason. Yeah, I guess so. But I'm in a slump for Expedition. I haven't day two'd any of the Expedition opens. Um, so I guess I'll just well, have to dig deep into my into my deep, deep pockets and my yeah, bank account. Say, to, yeah. if you, if you All my free time, yeah. Play long enough, you'll sure to find a seven win streak yeah. at some point, right? I, I think, yeah, I, I think I can manage that eventually, hopefully. Anyway. I guess uh, notably, I believe that the most recent deck you get 7-0 with or the most recent deck you get 7-1 with if you go 7-0 and you play another run and you get 7-1, I believe your 7-0 deck is the one that goes to day two. And if you keep doing it over and over again, your latest 7-1 deck is the one that goes to day two. If you just want to keep playing for some reason. Yeah, I suppose so. I I guess. If I get seven wins once, I'm not going to spend the time to you know keep <laughs> on going. I have other things I need to do. All right, so let's talk about uh, Not Expedition Throne, a format that I like a lot more right now. So the last last chance qualifier with the 24 players that have top 16 uh, two opens, including both Stormblast and myself, is going to be January 15th. You can go to their website to see if your name is on the list. That will be interesting. And it's thrown. So I'm happy about that. I don't know what the format is. They haven't announced it yet, have they? Nope. Can't single elimination with 24 players, although I guess you could also probably figure out a way to seed people and then go from there, which I wouldn't be too against, I think. In a kind of a crude sense, this last chance tournament is kind of like an invitational because eventually your really bad deck is going to get to seven wins. But the fun about invitational slash world is that because you get to pick the deck, it means you can bring as bad a deck as you want and there's nothing <laughs> stopping you. <laughs> yeah, that was your strategy for worlds last year, right? Oh, and it paid off wonderfully. <laughs> I brought yeah, an expedition deck to throw and Much it was great. To my dismay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, that's going to be January 15th. Looking forward to it, but also to more information. The last chance qualifier we had for season one of Eternal Organized Play was stacked, and it was a great tournament. So uh, looking forward to another one of those. 
finally, we have Worlds in February. Uh, I don't think the date has been announced yet, right? They just said February. Lots of good players in that list, but Stormblast and I are not. So we're going to be hoping to grab one of these last two spots over the course of the next month or so. How can you not be excited for Worlds? Like, obviously, we're excited for Worlds. Oh, yeah. I'm very curious to see the tournament structure. We don't know what the tournament structure is yet, but last year's tournament structure was really good. So I'm hoping th- this year they uh they they either keep up the same structure. I guess they can't do the same structure because they don't have 24 players, but um, I'm hoping they just, you know, make the structure just as good as last year's. You know, season one didn't have the greatest world structure, but season two had a very good world structure. So we'll see what they have for season three. Yeah. And also I hear they're incorporating draft, which is really cool. Really? Oh, that'd be exciting. That would be I exciting as heck. That. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah, I, I might have very closely, or it might have been, you know, a random Scarlet message or something. <laughs> yeah, or I could just be making things up, which, you know. <laughs> eh, that's what we do on this podcast, make things up wholesale. It's bound to happen at some point, right? Why does anyone trust us? What, yeah. are, what, what are we, some sort of like world competitors or something? <laughs> okay, what else do we have? Oh, yes, I wrote a guide, a quite lengthy one. If you are a salty loser or a balance complainer, uh, I have wrote the guide for you, uh, entitled The Ultimate Guide for Salty Losers and Balance Complainers. I don't know if it's for the people that would actually benefit from it directly or if it's for people to link to anytime there's Reddit posts that's like, why isn't Direwolf nerf Aegis now? Too oppressive. How come I can't kill things with my deck that takes, you know, 20 turns to assemble whatever i'm trying to assemble blah 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 those types of reddit posts so yeah i was tired of seeing those types of things so i wrote a guide for the people that makes them we'll see if anyone actually pays attention to it i have nothing to say about that <laughs> okay very well <laughs> thank you to all of our patrons tell mocos adzos pre work done son chrissy a dw and yeast out they support us week in and week out on patreon.com slash friends of eternal thank you for you know continuing to support even though we are not as regularly as we once were but we will still try to bring content that if its quality isn't high at least it is passable i think that's what we shoot for nowadays right storm blessed has is oh. just exiting the conversation from all <laughs> this, this tailspin that i'm in um and obviously a gigantic thank you to srfs our editor for not only doing this but also stepping in commentary for the fetl the previous week and doing some behind the scenes work for the last one so thank you so much to srfs as always good luck on the tournaments this coming week and expedition looks like it's a lot of fun so go out and enjoy it until next time we will see you in the friend zone Happy New Year. The Friends of Eternal Discord is the best place on the internet to get better at Eternal. We have players of all skill and experience levels all happy to help each other out on basically any aspect of their Eternal gameplay. And making all this possible is our generous patrons over at Patreon.com. If you'd like to support FECast or Friends of Eternal, consider donating at Patreon.com slash Friends of Eternal. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, we'll see you in the friend zone. Hi, SRFS. Hi, it's me, your conscience. It's me, your conscience speaking. Good job.